It is the greatest honor to stand before you this morning. Um, I, am, uh, I am humbled, and my hope is to uh, glorify God and to honor all of you and um, to let you kind of into my world. Uh, as you think about what to speak, you know, public speaking is probably one of the greatest fears that folks have. And um, as a, a warrior who has served um, on the front lines of crime and violence, there are days I would rather go into the hood and face dangerous situations sometimes than speak in front of a group of folks, especially when your pastor and his family are sitting here. And uh, so if I screw up, not only does he instantly know it, but he can replay it on YouTube and Facebook or listen to the app. So the stress level on me is slightly high, and I'm a little bit nervous. But, um, gracious God, give your servant the strength. Uh, you are my life, and may that life that you have poured into my heart uh, be revealed to these uh, dear and precious souls gathered here. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Um, uh, Independence Week. Independence picture, by chance? <laughs> yes. All right. So, welcome to my world. Um, it's uh, very uh, difficult to follow after Steve and his family. Thank you. I'm going to be crying all afternoon after watching your movie. Um, but uh, here's an orphan. Um, and he's uh, one of many uh, that over the years God has blessed me to be able to engage and enter into their lives and reveal the hope of the gospel and then watch them grow. Um, to celebrate Independence Day um, a year or so ago, he put this picture up in his little uh, Facebook world. And I thought, wow, what a change. Uh, when I first uh, met this young man um, uh, five years ago, uh, smoking cigarettes, hanging out with kind of, a, kind of a sketchy crew, watched him go through the phase of self-promotion out in the social networking world, um, and then uh, making some bad choices, living kind of a life that someone would say, oh, uh, this is real, you know, you're kind of in the party scene, you're, you're out there for other people to follow you, and uh, you're, you, you, you've got a, a group of friends you're running with. And at some point, he started to realize, this isn't real. This isn't reality. And we began to build a uh, mentoring brotherhood and friendship, um, sharing the gospel in bits and pieces, being there through difficult times. And 48 hours ago, from this moment right here, this young man called me, and from Sport Bike Hoodlum on the street, now Lake County Sheriff's Deputy. God is good. So, independence, liberty, and freedom from a captivity that he was living in and that so many others are living in too, and yet it took the hope of the gospel to set him free. And when he called, the first two things he did is he said, thank you for standing by me all these years, and he said, and thank you for revealing God's plan for my life. So, amazing, the power of the gospel. So today, since it is Independence Week, I wanted to um, share some of the things that have impacted my faith the most, and one of which is hardcore reality of the gospel. I am, I can be very emotional at times. I try to conceal that from everybody, just like frozen, conceal, don't feel. Um, and uh, some of you that are closest to me have seen my squishy side come out um, when I'm with the guys and I'm riding the bikes or at the racetrack or something. It's all like, <clears throat> yeah, nothing phases me. But uh, you've seen the weak sides. Um, so I want to kind of let you in to not only my world, but the things that allowed my faith to grow the most. And these are some of the solid things. I need a little disclaimer, though, before we start. Um, first, there is a, a great difference between the preaching style of both uh, my brother, Pastor Jesse, and myself. So uh, Pastor Jesse is more of a precision instrument. Do we have a precision instrument image? Okay, this is Pastor Jesse. <laughs> Organized, functional. Ability to find a studious study environment and produce these, these deep and rich messages that all of you can take with you. And then you have me. Okay. <laughs> also effective, but not as sterile. You have Pastor Jesse. Next Pastor Jesse. That's the previous Pastor Jesse. Okay. We've got Houston. Houston control here. Again. Redundant systems for safeties, back in, backups, uh, checking and double checking. You've got a, a team almost inside his mind that is producing this. 
and then you've got me. So we call carpet bombing. It's not quite as, as sterile. It is effective. You've got Pastor Jesse. This is Johnson Space Flight Center, similar to the other. You've got me. Again, carpet bombing. You've got Pastor Jesse. You've got me. You've got Pastor Jesse. You've got me. All right, you get the picture. Okay, that serves as my disclaimer. So once we get into all of this, um, uh, the disclaimer is that uh, if it doesn't come out quite as polished, uh, it, it does come from the heart. And, uh, and I hope it impacts you, not quite like carpet bombing, but that it does uh, impact your lives. So um, here we go. Um, the greatest treasure... I believe that a human being can carry with them through this life are stories. Steve and his family, I think, just kind of prove that. Um, um, my wife and I, when we were married, uh, we went on a honeymoon to England. We saved all our money, um, our families, all of, all of us are kind of scraping by paycheck to paycheck. So we didn't expect a lot of support there, but we, uh, we put together enough to go on this 10-day uh, tour to England, and we stayed in this beautiful place, Thornbury Castle, um, used to be owned by the uh, swine Henry VIII, and... Um, uh, but here you have, as you're thinking about it, you have this fortress, this beautiful mansion that was built. And someone built that not with the intent that they were going to die. The original owner was executed by Henry VIII, who took it over and made it his own place. I'm sure he only stayed there for a couple days, then gave it to somebody else that owed him a favor or that he owed a favor to. Um, but the point is you have this monument, this massive, massive home that would dwarf anything we can think of, even here in some of our, our nicer areas, and it just passes on to somebody else. And nobody really knows who the original owners are. You wouldn't have known about Henry VIII unless I had mentioned it. So monuments that we kind of build and construct, things that we think are the reality of what our existence and substance should be, really aren't. The, to me, the treasure of life is stories. The greatest stories come from those moments where you are engaging the hearts of other human beings with the hope of the gospel. These are the stories that matter. And you engage other people with the hope of the gospel. Sometimes it's not by uh, preaching to them, though that is a part. And it comes out not as preachy, but it comes out as us sharing um, truth of life that has changed us with other people. But sometimes it's just, it's, it's, it's gritty, it's dirty, it's hard, it's painful. You're with them through the ugly divorce. You're with them through um, the, the, the crumbling relationship situation. You're with them through the cancer. You're, you're, you're holding their hand or holding their body at a moment of critical and devastating impact, injury, or emotional collapse. And you're right there with them. And these are the moments where the greatest stories come from. And you'll have those to share with, with all the souls you encounter for the rest of your life. And at the moment you do pass on from this life to eternal life of Jesus Christ, those stories live on because everyone that was touched by your voice, your words, your testimony, they will then be spreading those stories. Uh, they were doing it at my work yesterday. They're like, can you tell us the story again where you jumped up on top of that tractor trailer and uh, the guy had, had, uh, had just opened up all of his sutures and had just bled out all over the camp. Can you tell us that story again? So I'm like, wow, I didn't even realize that uh, a story from my uh, former life as a police officer had had such an impact at the people at work. But the stories will survive. And the greatest stories come as you live the adventure of serving Jesus Christ. Um, Things that will affect your ability to have those stories is a misconception of reality. Um, reality um, is, is grounded in the truth of who Jesus Christ is. So what I thought I would do today is take a look at reality by examining um, the things that are, going to, that are actually going on around us that you can't see. The first of which is something we call captivity. Um, captivity is a state by which you have been overcome and are in a place you do not want to be by someone or something that is keeping you there. And a lot of times, particularly biblical captivity, involves something called exile. So what I'm going to be doing is making this, uh, this relationship between the physical biblical exile that we have an account of that occurs 
occurred to the uh, people of Israel as well as then to our personal lives and the captivities we fall into. And that's where I kind of want to start. I want to start with captivity with us. It's Independence Week. We are celebrating freedom, but what if we're not as free as we thought we were? What if we're actually under a captivity? And I'm not talking about anything political. I'm talking about in here, in uh, hearts or minds. Um, There are things that hold you captive. And what I wanted to do is introduce one of them to you right here. These little babies. These little babies that can do so much good. This is the source of much of the captivity many human beings, especially in our culture, are going to face. Uh, My wife was telling me a statistic the other day with each passing generation, with um, with the deeper involvement with these IT devices, we're losing approximately seven IQ points per generation. Um, I was doing some studying for this message, and I was looking up one of my heroes, who is Colonel Lawrence Chamberlain. And uh, if you remember him, who's got, who is he? Somebody tell me, where's a history buff? Chamberlain, yeah, where is it? Give me the place or what he did. What? Not, no. Uh, um, think of when Lincoln used to live at his Gettysburg address. Battle of Gettysburg, Little Round Top. Colonel Chamberlain is the guy who, when his forces were out of ammunition and they were getting ready to get hit again by the Alabama 15th coming up that ridge, he realized, we're going to charge. Fix bayonets. We're, we're going to do this. And he won. It's one of the most amazing acts of um, valor that we have on record. But do you know that this man was fluent in nine languages, including Arabic? Wow. Will we see that today in many of our young people? No. Why? Because it's so easy to get pulled into things like this. Captivity um, in our culture kind of sneaks up on us. So I developed what we call the gap F theory. Uh, Well, what I call the gap F theory, (laughs) because I invented it. (laughs) Um, Could we show the gap F theory pick, please? Do you have that? Yes. Greed, anger, porn, pleasure, pills, and fear. These are the things that are going to be gripping the hearts of the souls around us. And this is where we are going to fight our battle of presenting the reality of what is going on in the world versus the, um, the false reality that folks are living in as they've been overcome by this. Now, um, I don't think a lot of us here are struggling with just the, just the, the, uh, the, the, the main uh, words that are listed here. Um, I don't think everyone here is greedy. Um, but there, there is another type of um, uh, financial worry that can come through fear, and that's, uh, that's financial stress. You know, how many of us are worried about our finances? How many of us are worried about the finances to the point that it'll make us angry and we'll get in an argument with the people we love? How many of us are worried about finances and we'll get in an angry and an argument with people we love and we'll use harsh words? Uh, how many people are, are struggling with that? Um, Anger in these young men that I interact with, anger is simmering always right at the top. It's like self-control is just, it's been so eroded by the hurt and the pain. Um, Almost all of them to a T have a dad that's either not in their life or that it was in their life abusively. So anger is just, it's all they know. And it's simmering just below the surface. And it's waiting to destroy every good thing they can build. This anger will come out and just devastate everything. Um... Pornography, epidemic, devastating. Every man that I have ministered to in the state police, law enforcement community, and the military, where I currently serve as a mentor to many, many young men, almost every single solitary one is struggling with this battle of pornography, and they hate themselves for it. Nobody wants to be there. That's why you're held captive. You've been taken to a place you don't want to be. They don't want to be there, especially the ones who are followers of Christ. It's like, and I know because I was there as a younger man. This was my worst battle was pornography. Um, the crazed pursuit of pleasure. Uh, you'll see this in all the social media. Everyone comparing and contrasting themselves with what I have, what I don't have, what this person has, what I don't have. And there's almost this suicidal craze for narcissism and pleasure. Um, 
Pills, the, uh, the, you've, you've heard everyone talking about the opioid epidemic. Um, I think a lot of times these pills come because of this. Fear, oh, why am I pointing? This is, this is modern times. There we go. <laughs> because of this. How's that? Do I get points for this? Having a laser pointer? Everybody at home, I just produced a laser pointer. Yes, so I think the fear... Oh, somebody else produced a laser pointer. <laughs> show off. See, it's all of this comparing, comparing, you know? My laser pointer's bigger than your laser pointer. Oh, yeah? Well, mine has a flashlight, too. Um, so, it's the fear, the fear, and, um, and then, as you get older, and, I, and I, we have a congregation that is beautiful, because um, as I look around and I see uh, some of you young guys and gals, the, you know, the future coming up, I also see some of the very uh, mature and seasoned backbones of our faith, and, um, and there's different captivities we face. As we get older, I've noticed something weird, and some of you that are, are, are older, I have faith. I love the Lord. I believe without a doubt that when my physical body expires, I will be in the presence of the one true and holy living God. I was a detective my entire life. If I did not have, if there was an inkling of doubt in me about the reality of Jesus Christ, I would not be a Christian. But there is nothing left to doubt. I have total faith and confidence in the salvation of Jesus Christ that we maintain our identity as far as our awareness of who we are when we die. I think the transfiguration on the mount showed that. Remember when the guys went up on the hill and they saw Jesus and he was there with Elijah and Moses and they recognized them them and they were talking to each other and still had their identities, there's a glimpse into eternal life. So we're going to maintain this self-awareness. I think our bodies are going to be different because the Lord explains that very clearly in, um, uh, I think it's 1 Corinthians, where what you sow now is not what will be, but mere grain. But what you sow is not made alive until it dies. So there's this beautiful hope and expectation. But as I get older, I've noticed that I get anxious, does anybody else who's getting older notice that? It's not like, it's, um, it's not like I'm terrified, but there is almost uh, just this little bit of anxiousness, and uh, I can't really explain it. Um, I, I have faith. I'm not overcome by fear, but it's, it's there, and to some degree, it's enough that it, it can hold you captive, and I think that's a lot of pe- reason people will turn to self-medicating. 85% of the American population is self-medicating almost all of it for anxiety. So it's, uh, it's something that's out there. Now, we're in captivity. How do we get out of here? And that's the point. We get out of here, the point of this message. We get out of here um, by understanding reality. And to help us understand this the best way I can as a detective, um, as currently an investigator, um, I came up with something that, that I really enjoy doing. And I'm working on it for about uh, a little over two months. And, um, and the end result is this little product here. Could we have the timeline? Okay. I hope you can see it. I took a picture of my notepad. Um, also, at the uh, end of the message, if anyone wants, this plus some other field notes are all written. And they're on the back table there if you want to grab it to... Um, Uh, to take it uh, home with you so you can study it and look it up for yourself. I'm not a theologian or scholar by any means, but I just look at what was available to me. I took my quest study Bible that my wife had gotten me. I started looking at stuff, and I realized, oh my God, God is real as I'm going through this. Because a lot of times we have this idea of um, fairy tale. Um, God is these, these comfortable pleasant stories we have and they sustain us when we're young and they give us the comfortable memories as we get older but they haven't really struck to the level of reality and we must transition from fairy tale whimsy myth and comfortable stories to reality to be effective because reality is where you stand on the precipice of life and death and you make the greatest difference with your lives That's where we need to be as followers of Christ. When you watch a movie, um, if you were to um, think, well, me, when I'm looking at a movie, I try to think of, of where am I in this picture? And I am at that scene where the Calvary is coming over the hill. That is where I exist. In physical life, I try to put myself in that spot. Where is the rescue coming? Where is the, where is the hero going to emerge? Um, where is, is help? Help is on the way. Um, 
when you look at Lord of the Rings and they're just about to be overcome at Helm's Deep and everything is bad and Theoden's making the speech is, how can men stand in the face of such evil? Let's ride out. And you're like, oh, this is bad, this is bad. But wait, look to the east on the morning of the fifth day and they look and there's Gandalf with this huge army of the riders of Rohan coming down. That's where I live. That is my turf to operate in. I look for those opportunities to move in like that. Um, the, for the new one on the Star Trek movies, remember Nero, the angry Romulan in his dark brooding ship, and they're getting ready to destroy everything, and suddenly the guy on the bridge crew with him says, sir, it's another ship, and then boom, the Enterprise, beautiful white, guns blazing, pops on the scene, and all the evil that this bad guy has launched is now being lit up by the Enterprise. That's where I am. I'm in those scenes. You kind of get the picture. So to get there, we need to, we need to go to reality. So in the limited time we have left, boy, how do you do this when the time is so short? Oh my gosh, I've got like, I got like five minutes to go through almost 1,500 years. <sighs> okay, okay, with the pastor watching, got to do this. All right. Reality is based on facts. Some things are subjective, such as my statement that tr uh, stories are the greatest treasure. Some people may argue with that. Um, I think it's true. But uh, then there's also objective, which means there's really no room to argue. It's, you know, if it's, if there's just no room to argue. So here we go. Let's look at a couple things. Um, People are in captivity. They want to get out of captivity. Israel went into captivity. Judah went into captivity. Israel is the northern kingdom. Judah is the southern kingdom. Israel's capital is Samaria. Judah's capital is Jerusalem. In 721 BC, as you can see here, uh, the, Samaria, uh, the Assyrians overcame uh, Samaria and destroyed it. Um, in 612 BC, the, a new player on the scene, Babylon, came in, kicked the Assyrians' butts. They became the great power. 605 BC, they kicked the Egyptians' butts. They also came in and subdued Jerusalem and began their first captivity where they took Daniel and the boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, um, brought them all back to Babylon. Um, you know the account. Uh, some of you know the account. Uh, Daniel and his uh, friends, they became great men in this um, uh, Babylonian society, which ultimately became the Persian society because in 539 BC, um, Cyrus overthrew the Babylonians. You remember that account maybe from the Bible where uh, Belshazzar, the wicked son or grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, he's having this great orgy in his palace and he says, hey, bring out all the gold stuff from that temple that we wiped out in Jerusalem and let's you know make that part of our orgy. And so they were drinking out of the stuff and the hand appears on the wall and basically says, dude, cross the line, your time's up. Uh, that's paraphrasing. <laughs> and, um, and that very night, um, Babylon fell to the Persians. Um, Cyrus took over, and now this is where things get good. This is all history. Um, interesting. Look at this. 730 B.C., Isaiah's prophecy of the exile's return under Cyrus and it's Isaiah chapter 44, verse 28. So I'm going to flip there real quick. I've got three minutes left. Oh, my gosh. How do you do this? Stress level is getting higher. Isaiah 44, uh, 28. I marked it so it would be. Um, this is a prophecy, 730 B.C., 200 years before the Jews were allowed to return to their homeland. 230 uh, or 200 years approximately before they were allowed to return. Cyrus did not even exist. They were not even in captivity. So listen to this prophecy given. Who says of Cyrus? Oh my gosh, he's mentioned by name. He is my shepherd. He's not a shepherd. He wasn't a follower of, of the Jewish God. But Cyrus, he is my shepherd, the God who is able to take the people of pagan origin and guide them to do his will. And he shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built and to the temple your foundation shall be laid. Then you jump over to, I got it, I got it right here, Esther, Ezra, 2 Kings, I'm going, I got these marked, or excuse me, 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles 36.22. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, um, that the word of the Lord 
spoken by the prophet may be filled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth, the, the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has committed me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? May the Lord his God be with him, and let him go up. Oh my gosh, that happened right here in 538 BC. Cyrus, king of Persia, 200 years prior forecasted, releases Zerubbabel, one of the princes and a direct descendant of David, to take the first group of captives, uh, return them from exile um, to Jerusalem. Wow, it gets even better because you've also got this little point right here. While after Daniel had been taken in 540 BC, he makes this interesting prophecy in Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. I've got about a minute and a half. We're rolling with this. Daniel, I got you. I got you, Danny. I got you. Here you are. Daniel 9, 25. Know, therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah, you're going to gasp. It's going to happen. I gasped. I was sitting at Wilderness Lodge at Disney studying my notes, and I went, (gasps) sort of like that. And people thought I had swallowed a chip wrong. (laughs) Know, therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah, the Prince, Jesus, the risen Christ, God in the flesh, um, till Messiah, the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. March 4th, 444 B.C., Nehemiah initiates this when he is sent by Artaxerxes, son-in-law of Esther, who had been taken as queen to Xerxes. If you remember, this is all history. Nehemiah is then commissioned to go forth back to Jerusalem, rebuild the wall, which he did in 52 days. At the moment he was commissioned to do that, it kicked in this prophecy from 540 B.C., And you have 69 weeks of seven years, or 483 years, or 173,880 days, which ends on March 29th, 33 AD, Jesus enters Jerusalem. Wow. I am a police officer at heart. I live, eat, and breathe justice and evidence. What do you do with that? My God. There's a God. That's reality. That is why there's not a doubt in my mind that when I die, I'll be in the presence of the king. That is reality. Now, other things are going on. You've got Buddha in India from 560 to 479. We all heard about him. You've got Confucius in China. Nice touch with the second shot there. Um, You've got Socrates in Greece. You've got all these other players going on that you learn in the public school, but you don't learn this. But this was going on then, this unfolding plan for the salvation of mankind, because while you are in captivity, bullet point number one, God has already planned your escape. While you are struggling in the pornography, while these pills are just wiping you out, while your anger has devastated your family, while things seem to be in shambles and ruins, God has already planned your escape. And he's going to unfold his plan in your life if you are willing. You are going to be warned. People are going to come into your lives. There is going to be a a means of rescue, even if it's not a faithful person, such um, such as in the example we have of Cyrus. You're going to have someone there who is going to um, begin to get involved in this plan of escape is going to come to you. The second big point is while you are in captivity, God protects you. His plan is not to destroy you or to destroy us. His plan is to rescue you, to save you, to set you free. Why? Not so you can just simply stop doing bad things. That's where a lot of us choke hold in our faith. The plan is that you will begin to project his goodness into the world through a life transformed and set apart to glorify God and to unfold his will. That's the point, not just to stop doing bad. So, God has a plan for your escape while you're in captivity. He's already got it worked out. And while you're in captivity, God will protect you. I will close with this passage because, wow, the time goes by fast. I will close with this, and it is um, Isaiah chapter 1, going for Isaiah. Oh, man, now all my notes are mixed up for the next 
service. How do you deal with that too? Well, you just keep that in one neat notepad and everything's just, I'm a disaster up here. Oh my gosh. Okay, I've even got a mark and I can't find him. Okay. Um, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Reprove the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. These are not words to people that are like, Oh, I'm, I'm ready to roll. These are people, words to people who are hurt, struggling, broken, but they want a way out. The reality of God is that he is real. Um, the reality of his character is that he's going to rescue not only us, but then he's going to put us with the testimony of our rescue into the path of others to change their lives. Godspeed on your journey. How did I do? Okay.